Welcome, 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 everyone. We are so excited to have you here today. And today we have Bill Exeter and Alina who are going to speak about 1031s and what they are and how they work and how you can avoid paying taxes. We love people not having to pay taxes. So uh, like that, we think that's super important. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Bill. Uh, so uh, let me tell you a, bit, a little bit about the nest egg builder. So the nest egg builder <laughs> works with a passive investor who's looking for even better returns. No matter what you already have, you might like something that is going to give you double digit returns or even better. Who knows? But let's have a conversation and see what's working best for you. So I've known Bill for a really long time. I was in the exchange world for years and years, and Bill came to all of our meetings. So it's William, he goes by Bill Exeter. He's the chief executive officer of Exeter 1031 Exchange Services and Trust Company. Have to remember that being a, this is a trust, all about trust. So really important to know that he's got this as a trust company. So Bill has been in the financial services industry since 1980. He began specializing in real estate tax strategies in 1985 with a, a specialty emphasis on the 1031 exchange, 1033 exchanges, self-directed IRAs, and individual 401k plans, title holding, trust, land trust, specialty holding escrows, and custody accounts with an emphasis on non-traditional assets or alternative investments. Mr. Exeter has written and lectured extensively on 1031 exchanges, 1033 exchanges, 721 contributions, 121 exclusions, self-directed IRAs, individual 401k plans, title holding trusts, land trusts, Bill's an expert, as you can tell, consultant and witness in legal and regulatory matters. Bill administers more than a, has administered more than 125,000 1031 exchange transactions during his almost 40 years in his career and is one of the founding members of the 1031 Exchange Industry Trade Association, the Federation of Exchange Accommodators. We are so thrilled to have you. And one of his sidekicks, you might call her, is Alina Moradian. I don't know if I said that right, Moradian. And she's been a financial in the financial service industry since 1991, including commercial banking, uh, lending, specialty deposits. She joined the Exeter Group in 2021 as a business development officer, specializing in forward 1031 exchanges, reverse 1031 exchanges, oh, we love those, improvement of 1031 exchanges, and foreign property 1031 exchanges. Really all very important. We are going to learn a heck of a lot from Bill and Alina. Take it away. Oh, wait, I have a quote about, I have a quote. I love doing these little quotes because all the things you do and the difference you can make. And from all the things you have done, Bill, this is what I see about you. Money flows like water to good ideas. And you have created so many good ideas with your 125,000 closings. Congratulations. So take it away, Bill. Sounds good. That's probably why I have no hair. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, welcome everybody, and glad to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, and I'm going to, you know, present for about 20 minutes on 1031 exchanges, and then from there we can take questions and answers. Uh, happy to go as basic or as advanced as you would like. Uh, nothing would be uh, out of the ordinary. Nothing would be off the table. Uh, so there's our our uh, starting or title page. We call it unraveling the mystery of 1031 exchanges because we get a lot of people who call us and just say. You know, I've talked to three or four people. I've gotten three or four different answers. I'm completely confused as to what really matters. 
So we try to unravel that mystery because there's just a lot of opinions out there. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means there's a lot of different opinions. And that creates a lot of confusion sometimes. So I'm going to dive into the more important parts um, and explain why there's confusion, what really matters, what really qualifies. And that'll help you make better informed investment decisions when you're going through your investment uh, decision-making process. So that is my... <clears throat> excuse me, my QR code there, uh, which is our all my contact information and brochures and, and the, things like that. Um, and as as Peggy said, you know, it's Exeter 1031 Exchange Services. We're the qualified intermediary. We do all types of exchanges. We cover all 50 states. We also do foreign property 1031 exchange transactions. So we're one of the few that will do uh, foreign property exchanges. That's the first area that I, I kind of want to clarify because a lot of things you read on the internet will say you cannot do an exchange of foreign property. And that that's not true, but it's not wrong either. What they're really trying to say is you can't sell U.S. property and do a 1031 exchange into a foreign property, or you can't sell foreign property and 1031 exchange into a U.S. property. It has to be all U.S. property or all foreign property, but you can do a 1031 exchange on foreign property. It just means that uh, you're selling a <clears throat> rental or investment property in a foreign country, and the sale of that property will trigger a U.S. taxable gain. So there you, you could do a 1031 exchange and reinvest in other foreign property that is also held for rental or investment. And it won't have any impact on the foreign taxes, but you will defer the U.S. taxes that you might uh, incur. So mm -hmm. that's all about foreign to foreign. If you have uh, either you or clients are, you know, in that excuse me that that position. So we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, the Exeter Group started literally 20 years ago. This is our 20th anniversary. Uh, personally, I've been doing this now 40 years. I've hit the 40 mark. That's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. uh, just kind of scratch your head like I cannot believe I've been doing this for 40 years. It's kind of amazing. I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've got a lot of expertise and experience. We've done a lot of exchanges of all different shapes, sizes, forms, etc. Um, we always say that, you know, with all the experience we have, we should have the answer. So, you know, go ahead and ask us. We're happy to brainstorm. You know, even if you're working with another QI and, and they can't answer the question, I'm happy to chat with you and kind of help you get through the process there. And as Peggy mentioned, we also have Exeter Trust Company. Um, Exeter Trust Company is licensed, regulated, and audited by the Wyoming Division of Banking. I'm going to touch upon that in a minute. Uh, that also gives us the ability to uh, roll out other products. So we have, you know, self-directed IRAs, title holding trusts, specialty holding escrows, et cetera. Uh, the self-directed IRA is our second biggest product, and that's where investors want to buy real estate, deeds of trust, mortgages, tax lien certificates, uh, private entities, LLCs, partnerships, et cetera, inside of their retirement account. Uh, so we do a lot of that as well. And I'm going to breeze through some of these slides uh, since we have 20 minutes. Um, you know, we get a lot of people who call and ask, well, why should I do a 1031 or, or should I? And that's those are all good questions. You always want to meet with your tax advisor first. There are reasons you may not want to do a 1031 exchange. So always meet with your tax advisor so you know exactly uh, what your tax consequences are going to be. And from there, you can decide if you want to do a 1031 exchange. But sometimes you may have some other loss a net operating loss, carry forward, uh, suspended passive activity losses, uh, different types of depreciation that may offset your gain, either partially or fully. So you, you always talk to the tax advisor to see what uh, is right for you. But uh, a lot of investors look at the 1031 exchange as a transaction tool. I'm selling real estate. I don't want to pay tax. Uh, and that's what it's certainly designed for. But it's more than that. Uh, it's a wealth building tool. It allows you to keep exchanging over time. Every time you sell, uh, you do an exchange, it defers the taxes into the next property. So it keeps all of your money in your pocket instead of paying about a third of your profit to federal and state government. It keeps it in your pocket so you can invest in bigger properties, larger properties, more units, You know, improve your cash flow and ultimately increase your net worth. So it's all about exchanging over and over and over throughout your lifetime. And then when you pass on, whoever you leave the property to gets a step up in cost basis. So literally, if you bought the property for, let's say, 100000 
Today it's worth a million. You pass, you leave it to your kids. Your kids will inherit that and their cost basis is stepped up to a million dollars. That means they pay zero capital gain taxes, zero depreciation recapture taxes, and they avoid all the other taxes that might get triggered. So the best way to remember this is swap until you drop. <laughs> we have a morbid <laughs> sense of humor. Um, but keep exchanging when you pass on, all the taxes go away. Uh, having said that, there's we get a lot of questions like, well, what should I do? 97% of our clients do forward 1031 exchanges. That means you sell first, you buy second. Uh, 3% of our transactions are reverse 1031 exchanges. You buy first and you sell second. Uh, with a reverse, they're a lot more complicated. So it, it's great for markets like today where you have a difficult time uh, finding property, negotiating to buy it, uh, you know, doing the due diligence and actually closing on the purchase. So with the reverse, it allows you to actually close on the purchase first, and then you've got 180 days to sell your current property. So it takes a lot of the risk out of that whole process. But the problem is we have to hold title to your property during that six month process. Uh, traditional lenders don't like that. So reverses are a lot more complicated. That's why there's only about 3% of our transaction volume. The improvement exchanges, you don't see a whole lot of. Effectively, you're selling property. You use some of the proceeds through a 1031 to buy dirt or, or any property, I guess. And then you have proceeds left over and you use those proceeds to make improvements uh, to the property. So capital improvements can be done through the 1031 exchange process. Again, we have to hold title to the property. Traditional lenders don't like it. Uh, so that does make it very challenging, uh, but it is a great way to do certain types of projects and include the, the improvements inside the 1031 exchange. Um, first point, and this is where there's still lots of confusion out there, First point is you have to get your 1031 exchange set up before closing. If your sale transaction closes before the 1031 exchange is in place, it's taxable. There's no way to go back and fix that. And the reason for that is the purchase and sale agreement is assigned to the qualified intermediary. We step into your shoes. We become the seller, literally. And that's what allows you to defer the tax payments. If the exchange is not set up, even if you tell escrow or your closing agent or your closing attorney uh, not to disperse the funds because you're going to do a 1031 exchange, the fact that you've closed without an exchange in place means you have the right to receive the proceeds and it's taxable. There's no way to go back and fix that. So be very, very careful. Uh, make sure the 1031 exchange is set up before you close. Next is nobody ever talks about safety of your of the client funds of the 1031 exchange funds. So I wanted to address that real quick. You know, qualified intermediaries, uh, our industry has no ability to be licensed, to be regulated, to there's no government oversight. Uh, it just doesn't have a regulatory body. Um, we thought that's wrong. We wanted to be regulated. So we went down the banking path. And that's why we went through a couple of years of review, exam, audits. Uh, et cetera, until we got our own trust company charter. So now all of the funds are held by Exeter Trust Company. That means we're one of the few that has any regulatory oversight. And that makes uh, the, the regulators make sure that we are operating in a safe and sound manner. Uh, if we do anything that is not above board, they will come in and either take us over, close us down, what have you, and make sure the client is protected. So that's what that's all about. So government oversight is critical. I've been doing this for 40 years. Almost every exchange company I've seen fail would have been prevented had there been government oversight. So to me, that is the most important. Uh, nobody ever talks about it because there's very few who are regulated. So they don't want to tell you something that they can't uh, satisfy. You also want to look at the bonding and insurance because uh, those are all critical to make sure you've got fidelity bond in case there's a crime, misappropriation of funds. You want to make sure there's errors and emissions insurance. That's probably more important than fidelity bond because, you know, people are human. Everybody's going to make a mistake. When the exchange company makes a mistake, you want it to be covered by the bond. So the e and insurance coverage is critical. And then finally, you want to make sure that whatever exchange company you're working with is holding the funds in a qualified trust account or a qualified escrow account. That's critical. That holds the funds clearly in a trust capacity. Uh, if there's a bankruptcy filing, they, the bankruptcy court cannot go after those funds. When Land America failed in 2008-2009, the judge ruled 
they were corporate funds, not client funds, because they were held in Land America's corporate name. That works from a 1031 exchange perspective, but it does not work in a bankruptcy filing. Uh, so a lot of clients got hurt there. Mm. Um, next is qualified use. This is probably the most important slide in the deck. Uh, and this is where there's the most confusion as well. So with qualified use, that means that any property you sell and buy through the 1031 exchange has to be held for rental, meaning some type of income production, or it could be held for investment. You could buy property and hold it for capital appreciation. So a lot of what you hear on the internet, it is, has to be held for rental property. That's not completely true. It, it could be held for investment. It does not have to produce cash flow as long as it's held for investment purposes, that would qualify. Or it can be held for business use. So if you have your own business and you buy maybe a little office building or a little retail shop or something like that, and it's used in your business, that would also qualify. So all of those are really the requirements. Where the confusion comes in is people really get hung up on how long have you held title to property? And we'll get people who say, I, I called and somebody told me that I can't do a 1031 exchange because I didn't hold it for at least one year, one year and a day, 18 months, 24 months. Well, what qualifies? And that's the problem. The answer is there is no holding period. <clears throat> the tax code, the regulations have no holding period in them. But they do say you have to have the intent to hold for rental investment or business use. So the issue there is, and the reason people get hung up on the holding period, is the longer you hold the property as rental, investment, or what have you, the easier it is to prove intent. But that's not the end all. The holding period does not determine whether you do or you do not qualify. It helps prove your intent. But the real requirement is, did you have the intent to hold it for rental, investment, or business use? So a quick example, we had a client years ago sell to an exchange, bought a condo, didn't read the CCNRs, quickly found out after closing that it had to be owner occupied, not rental occupied. Uh, immediately sold, did another exchange and was audited. In his case, uh, he held that one property for about a month and a half. The auditors allowed it to qualify, even though it was one and a half month holding period, because he could prove his intent was to hold for rental purposes, but there was a business reason why he couldn't continue it. So anything that you use to prove that is perfect. That's the most important part is your intent. Uh, so again, the holding period doesn't really matter, but the longer you hold it as rental or investment property, the easier it is to prove intent. So that's really the key issue there. Lots of information, uh, misinformation or confusion out there on like-kind property as well. There's still a lot of people who believe that if you sell a condo, you have to buy a condo. If you sell apartments, you have to buy apartments, et cetera. Um, that is not true. Uh, like kind literally means you are selling real estate, you have to buy real estate. So anything that is considered real property will qualify. And this is a list of all the different types of properties that will qualify. You'll notice that it includes air rights, water rights, mineral rights, certain types of oil and gas investments, fractional ownership interests like tenant and common investment properties or the more popular Delaware statutory trusts. Um, all of those are considered like kind for 1031 exchange purposes. So you can exchange between all sorts of real estate classes and still qualify for 1031 exchange treatment. The key thing to remember, if there's any personal use, primary residence, second homes, vacation homes, et cetera, they probably don't qualify because they're not really held for rental or investment. You could always convert the use. You could stop the personal use. You can start you know, actually holding it for investment purposes, and then it could qualify. This slide is talking about those of you who own real estate inside of an entity. So if you own your real estate in a partnership with multiple partners, if you own it in an LLC with multiple membership members, um, and if you own it in a corporation, you have to remember that the individuals do not own real estate. They own a partnership interest, a membership interest, a shares of stock in a corporation, et cetera. So when they're getting cash distributions from a sale of property, you can't 1031 exchange those. However, there's lots of ways to proactively fix this issue. Um, so we can sit down and talk about your situation. The, the big point here is if you own property in an entity that's not disregarded, meaning it's treated as if it's a separate entity, 
partnership, multiple member LLC, uh, corporation, et cetera. Now's the time to ask your tax advisor or, or give us a call and walk through the process of what you think your exit strategy will be and then to determine if you need to change the ownership at any way or any method so that you would qualify for a 1031 exchange. So that's critical. Uh, I'm going to cover these real quick because I think most people know that. But when the sale closes, you've got 45 calendar days to identify what you're going to buy. Uh, that moves very quickly. So if you can delay the close of escrow or delay the close of your, of your closing, then you buy yourself more time because the deadline doesn't start running until the sale actually closes. And that's critical. Start looking for property early. Consider looking at the Delaware Statutory Trust, either as a primary investment option, a backup investment option. That could help save the day in a lot of cases. Now, after the 45 days, you have an additional 135 days to actually complete your 1031 exchange. So it's 45 plus 135 for a total of 180 days. Uh, identification, you have to identify the property. These are the three rules, and we don't have a whole lot of time to go into detail here. Most people use the three property rule, so they'll identify up to three properties. The intent there is you identify three, you probably intend to buy one, and the second and third are backup properties. The challenge in today's market, as you know, it's a crazy market. So if you if the first property you really want doesn't work out, the second and third properties are probably long gone. So you got to keep that in mind when you're going through the identification process. Uh, that's why going back to my last comment, consider the Delaware Statutory Trust, if nothing else, as a backup strategy that can really help save you in case you're, the property you really want doesn't work out. Um, and this is kind of the third area where there's lots of misinformation out there. The question is, you know, if you sell property, um, how much do you have to reinvest uh, to defer all of your taxes? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of investors who think you only have to reinvest your taxable gain or your profit, or you only have to reinvest your equity or your cash that comes out of the sale. Uh, none of those are true. It's really the top level. So let's say you're selling property worth just a million dollars to make it easy. You can subtract your routine selling expenses, so your broker's commission, title escrow, et cetera. Um, that's going to get you a net sale price of about 950 Whatever you purchase, if it's one or two or three properties, the total of what you buy has to be equal to or greater than about 950. So you're trading equal or up in value based on that net sale price. Notice we didn't subtract the mortgage value. It's only your routine selling costs. And then all of your equity, all the cash that comes out of your sale has to be reinvested. So the government's really taken the position that you, you, you own an asset at 950 net, and as long as you stay fully invested at that level or higher, you can defer all your taxes. Uh, but contrary to what you read on the internet, where it says you have to trade equal or up in value, uh, you have to reinvest your equity, you have to replace your debt, that's not completely true. A partial 1031 exchange is okay. So when they say that, it, you know, it, a partial exchange does not hurt your 1031 exchange. It just means you're going to pay some tax. So in that million dollar example, maybe you sell for a million, your net sale price is 950. Maybe you find property that you really like at 800,000. So you're technically trading down by $150,000. The 150 would be taxable, but everything else would be tax deferred. So a partial exchange is okay. You can trade down, you can pull cash out, just know that you're going to pay some tax. And that's really the issue, but partial exchanges are perfectly okay. And then last slide, and then we can open it up for questions. Um, and this is one of my favorite slides because you get a lot of folks who bought property, have lived in it for years and years as their primary residence. And all of a sudden they want to sell and they've got a huge gain and a huge tax problem. So I like, to, <clears throat> excuse me, I like to use one of our clients as an example. This is a number of years ago, but a uh, couple in La Jolla, California, bought property, lived in it for 42 years as their primary residence. Um, they wanted to go back east with their family, but they found out their capital gain was $8 million. Yeah. So if they sold, they would get $500,000 tax-free. They'd get killed on taxes for $7.5 million. Fortunately, the IRS has come out with a ruling back in 2005 where you can move out of the property, convert it to an investment property. 
I would recommend renting it for two years so you can easily prove your intent was to convert it to investment property. And then you've got one more year to sell that property where you can still qualify for the $500,000 tax-free exclusion. But now you've rented it for two years, so you can also qualify for a 1031 exchange. So in their case, we said move out, rent it for two years. They did that. They immediately kicked the tenant out at the two-year mark, uh, rent or uh, put the market uh, property in the market, sold it. You got to close before the end of that three-year window. But it, and they did. And at that point, they got five hundred thousand tax-free. The seven and a half million was deferred through a 1031 exchange, and they were able to get back east with their family. So that's a phenomenal strategy when you've got a primary residence that's you know, shot up a lot in value and got a huge gain to deal with. And then when you're dealing with transactions, there's often complex problems that pop up. Sometimes you're, maybe you're buying one property and you're going to sell five and the five sales don't occur at the right time that you really intended them to. Maybe you have to sell two and then buy your new property and then sell three more or some combination. There's there's a possibility to combine a regular forward 1031 exchange with a reverse 1031 exchange to put all these pieces together. Mm -hmm. It just all depends on timing. So that's something we can all help uh, sit down and kind of walk through the process, see what the timing looks like and what might qualify. And that was a quick whirlwind tour on 1031 exchange transactions. Um, I'll flip it back to you, Peggy. Oh, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, I actually learned something I didn't know. Uh, but I do talk about this all the time. And we always called it a straw man. But I keep telling people that they could put the, sell their properties and just keep it all open until they find the other property and then close at that time. But if you could do the reverse... That would be far more convenient to a to a uh, person that's got a lot of properties they want to sell, and I've got somebody that wants to do that, so I'm gonna have him give you a call. Sure, yep, happy to chat. And, yeah, and talk about how he could do that. Um, Eugene has a question, and could you close your uh, close your info? I'll put it back yes. up right before we close. There we out. go. Eugene. Uh. Thanks, William. You you answered one of my questions because we hold a lot of properties in uh, land trust. So I was going to ask that, but you answered it. Um, structural installment mm -hmm. sales versus ten thirty one opinion. Uh, with with structured installment sales, and they're marketed under different names. So you've got the structured installment sale. There's a seller carry back note. Uh, there's a deferred sales trust and monetized installment sales. Uh, so there's a bunch of them out there. They're all drafted under section 453 of the tax code, which is the installment sale code. You have to be very, very careful. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's a couple of different areas. So I'll, I'll focus on state level first. California, for example, has come out and said, those don't work. They will not defer taxes. So if it's California property or you're a California resident, you're gonna have to pay tax. Uh, in California. <laughs> California has also put qualified intermediaries like us on notice that if we work with the client and they do a structured settlement, a structured sale, and we do not withhold the, the California franchise tax, we are subject to penalties and interest, et cetera, because we failed to withhold. At the federal level in 2023, uh, the IRS put the monetized installment sale on their dirty dozen list. Uh, the Dirty Dozen list, uh, it sounds bad, and for most of them, it probably is. But the Dirty Dozen list really says these are either scams or they're transactions where you have to be very careful because we're not sure they qualify. Um, so that raises eyebrows that we know the IRS doesn't necessarily just automatically approve these. Then later in early 2024, they put the monetized installment sale and anything drafted similar to on what they call a listed transaction. And that means that if you actually do one, you have to disclose on your tax return that you've done a structured sale transaction. So I would, um, it doesn't mean they absolutely positively will not qualify. 
but you need to be extremely careful, have your tax advisors really take a hard look at it and, and make sure they're comfortable with it. Because in, in all likelihood, it will probably trigger a review, at least maybe a full audit. And you want to be in a position to defend that. What's, what is structured? What is a structured exchange? That's a structured sale. Um, so usually what happens, they're all a little different, but but similar. So they're drafted under Section 453, which is an installment sale code. It's like a seller carryback note, if you will. Well, so effectively, you've sold your property to a buyer, um, and then you, you insert an intermediary. This is not a qualified intermediary like a 1031 exchange, but you insert an intermediary. You are then on paper selling your property to the intermediary. The intermediary gives you a note, a promissory note. So it's like a seller carryback note. And then the intermediary actually sells the property to the real buyer for cash. The intermediary then invests that cash and then every month makes a payment on that promissory note to you. Um, and so that's where a lot of folks have always looked at that and said, this, you know, it just doesn't pass the smell test. There's not a real business purpose for doing that other, to, other than avoiding taxes. So uh, my opinion is be very careful, walk on thin ice there. Isn't there a place you could actually sell your carry back note and get cash or get payments? Is that part of the DST or? Absolutely. That, um, that's a great question because right now with interest rates being where they're at, we're having lots of phone calls where the seller says, I'm trying to sell my property, but to get it done, the buyer wants me to carry back a note, the seller carry back note. Uh, you could do that, but seller carryback notes make a 1031 exchange very difficult because you have to reinvest all your equity, all your net proceeds. And your mm -hmm. net proceeds are not just your cash, they're also the seller carryback note. So it can be done. There's really like five different options for seller carryback notes. Effectively, you either put your own money out of pocket in and you're acting as the lender, you lend the money out of pocket to the buyer you get the promissory note and your 1031 exchange ends up with all cash. Uh, most people don't have that kind of cash laying around. So the second and third options, uh, the second one is what you just said. You could sell the note. So they would draft the seller carryback note in our name as your qualified intermediary. And then you would arrange to sell the note out of your 1031 exchange account. And now your exchange has all cash and you could move forward with your 1031 exchange. Okay. Most note buyers want a discount. They want to yep. increase the yield. Otherwise, they're not interested. So uh, you have to look at the numbers and see if it makes sense. But there are note brokers out there who do nothing but buy notes. Yep, we know a few. That's yep. why I'm asking, because they'll buy it out. But you're right. They always want that discount. Even if you've made it like with a 10 or 12 percent return, they still want a discount. Yeah, It's it, an ego thing, I think. So what is the difference then between a DST and a 1031? Oh, good question. Um, in, in fact, I kind of laugh because you know a lot of times you go to websites and you can't tell what that website really does because right. it gets confusing. So the 1031 exchange is the actual tax deferral process. Um, so it's selling property, going through that 1031 exchange or the tax deferred process to defer your taxes. And the DST or Delaware Statutory Trust is one of your replacement property options you can look at. Okay. So you always need to do the 1031 exchange, and then you decide what do you want to buy as your replacement property. Um, and it kind of boils down to do you want active management or do you want passive management? So the you know, if you uh, work with your agent and you go out and you find property, you do your due diligence, you buy it, you finance it, et cetera, and then you do all the repairs and maintenance, that's your active management. Or you could identify a Delaware statutory trust where the, the trust does everything for you. So it's passive management. Uh, people joke about it being mailbox management, although today it's direct deposit management, I guess. <laughs> but it, it takes a lot of the, the uh, headaches out of the real estate. So it depends on what your goals and objectives are, but that's certainly a, a target of a lot of our clients who want to get out of real estate, then they talk to their tax advisor and find out, oh my gosh, I've got a huge tax liability. I don't want to manage anymore, but I don't want to get killed on taxes either. So that's where the DST has, plays a big role. I'm asking because we have a client that is doing a 1031. He put his money into a DST, but he's still planning to work with us 
oh, and we've given him several properties to review where he would go in as a tick and do the 1031. But how could he put his money into DST and then get it back out to do a 1031 as a passive investor? As Good a tick? question. Uh, there are, but there's not common. many, <clears throat> but there, there are a few DSTs where you invest in the DST and then it will do a refi cash out uh, event, a liquidation event, usually at the three or four month mark, some are sooner. Um, and so you really do a 1031 exchange into the DST and then they do the cash out refi, take the cash, and then you can invest that cash anywhere you want. Um, you have to be careful with those cash out because uh, the question is, or the question is, do you have the intent to reinvest in the new asset or are you cashing out and liquidating? Um, so if anybody wants to do a, one of those and the, the cash out is like the day after closing, I'd be very careful with that. If the cash out is three, four months later, <clears throat> excuse me, and the cash out is, if you read the paperwork, the cash out is not necessarily guaranteed. I think those work because there's always a chance in three to four months, something could go wrong and the cash out doesn't happen. So we'd have to look at the PPM and see exactly what that particular deal is. But there are some programs out there that'll do a cash out for you. Okay, so they're all different. You just have to ask. It's what I'm gathering. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> lots and yeah. lots of reading. So everything, I'm like I said, I talked to somebody, DS, uh, DST today, Delaware Statutory. And my big question to them is, so what kind of, what kind of interest or whatever you want to call it, cap rate that are you getting back? And they said they were getting four to seven percent, four and a half to seven percent. And I'm like, why would anybody go into something like that when you could get usually seven to 20 percent annual returns? May not cash flow, but you're still getting that kind of a, a return. And um, they're like, well, we'd be interested in looking at something like that. And I said, well, I'll send them to you then because we've sure. got them. Uh, they they can't believe that there's that you could get seven or eight percent like out of a multifamily, and yeah, you can. And usually in other assets, you could get even a better return. Frankly, I see multifamily as the least return of all the commercial asset classes. Great so, question. I'm going to have to educate the DST people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess the first thing to keep in mind, too, is the DST is not designed for the investor who's really trying to build equity and hit the ball out of the park. The DST investment is really targeting those investors who want to get out of real estate. They've probably already built up their net worth, and they're probably in retirement or, or even beyond and they don't want the headaches, you know, what they call the terrible T's, et cetera. Um, so they're looking at something that's safe and more conservative. That's kind of what they're going after with that market. So the rates of return uh, for the DSTs today as starting is probably, say, three and a half, three and a quarter at the low side, uh, probably approaching 6% or so. There are some that are beyond 6% or higher than 6%. You need to ask questions when it's when the rate's getting up there a lot higher than the average DST. Start asking the question why. Uh, some DST sponsors actually take some of the principal to, as part of the payout, so the percentage return looks higher, and you're really getting some of your money back. So you want to make sure you read the private place memorandum, really understand how they're projecting the yields and, and computing that. Uh, but it's not designed to hit the ball out of the park. So if you're still trying to really build your net worth and et cetera, you probably want to look at something that's, like you said, is going to be maybe 7 to 20 percent and uh, it'll do better for you because you probably have a higher risk tolerance at that point. OK. Oh, and what's the cost and the DST trust company cost? Oh, yeah. So uh, you have fees, Bill. I know you have fees mm -hmm. and that's on top of the escrow. So tell us a little bit about how those fees work. And do you know about the fees on the DST? Sure, I can kind of work do into you, that. Do you, um, do, you, do you also do DST? 
We don't do DSTs. We don't want to have a conflict of interest. So if we're working on the 1031 exchange as your qualified intermediary, we want to focus on doing that, doing it right, doing it well. We don't want you to worry about us trying to also get paid at the back end. So there are qualified intermediaries out there who act as the QI, but they also sell property and they try to make money on the back end. To me, that's a conflict. Yeah. I have. We only do the QI work. Uh, and we don't get compensated by any of the replacement property options out there. We don't recommend them. Uh, we're completely neutral. Uh, so we work with whoever you want to work with and whoever you want to acquire property with uh, as your qualified intermediary. The uh, the fees, so I can kind of cover the fees. The fees depend on the type of exchange. So 97% of them are regular forward exchanges. And if it's one sale, one purchase, our fee is a flat fee of $1,295. Uh, the $1,295 includes everything. So that's all the usual exchange documentation. Uh, like I said, we're one of the few that has regulatory oversight. So we offer every single client a uh, separate uh, segregated dual signature qualified trust account through Exeter Trust Company. There's no extra charge for that. That's all included in the $1,295. Uh, we automatically spread your funds across, the, today at least, we spread it across eight different banks. So instead of getting uh, the $250,000 in FDIC insurance, you automatically get eight, uh, $2 million in FDIC insurance. Um, and there's facilities to get more than that if your transaction is a higher dollar va value. So all of that's included in the twelve ninety five. dollars If you get into the reverse uh, improvement type exchanges, then you're getting into the seven to twelve thousand dollar category, depending on how complicated it is. So those are a lot more involved, a lot more complicated. There's a lot more moving parts, and there's a lot more risk to us because we have to hold title to the property. So while um, you're holding title, do you have to do you have to do the property management too, or does the end user going to take care of that? Good question. So we'll take title to the property, and then we'll execute a, a uh, absolute net lease. So the client actually has the ability to rent it, collect the rents, pay the bills, et cetera. The only thing you would not do while we hold title is depreciate the property because you're still depreciating the property you haven't sold yet. Uh, but other than that, we would do just holding title. The, in, the investor or the client would do all the other work. We do set up a separate LLC just for that transaction. That way the client's protected because we don't, we don't want to hold all of the real estate for all the clients in one entity. All it takes is one lien or judgment or toxic waste or whatever, and that would infect all of the properties. So we always use a brand new LLC for each client's transaction. It also protects us in case something does go wrong on the property. If they sue, they sue the LLC instead of uh, us directly or the client. So it's really a liability protection. Thank you. And the, did I interrupted you, so I apologize. And you got all your costs out? Because yeah. you're holding oh, properties. Yeah, so how many properties, like, I don't know, we'll just make up that Eugene's got eight properties he wants to exchange into one larger property. Mm -hmm. So you, you're gonna are you gonna you're gonna hold title to what are you gonna hold title to? To the new property because it's a reverse? Yes, if it's a reverse exchange, typically we hold title to the new property for a lot of different reasons. Um, in that example, let's say Eugene's got the eight properties to sell, one to buy. Uh, he does a reverse exchange. <clears throat> uh, we buy the new property first. The only thing that has occurred at that point is what we call the parking arrangement. Uh, so that means we took title to the property. That's it. It triggers the 180-day window to sell all eight of those properties. The question there is what happens if you sell the eight properties for a lot more than you anticipate? Uh, maybe you get into bidding wars, the market keeps going up, you know, et cetera. And all of a sudden you bought property for 2 million. When you've sold your eight properties, maybe you sell it for two and a half million. Um, at that point, you can actually go out and buy a second replacement property to use up the difference. Mm. Uh, so that's why we really want to hold title to the property you're buying. If we hold title to the properties you're selling, that is a possibility if the numbers work out but there's no ability to adjust it at the back end. The exchange is really at the front end. Got it. Yep. And then and then the cost on that to Eugene in this case would be because it's one property, but it's still a little complicated because 
he's selling them. The properties don't all close at the same time. So a little bit of cash is coming in at a time or how does that work? You, uh, good point. Um, so yeah, in terms of the fees, if there's eight sales and then one purchase, uh, either way on either is type, either a forward exchange or a reverse exchange, we have the base fee that we mentioned. The base fee would include the first sale and the first purchase, each additional property. So in that example, there'd be seven additional relinquished properties. Each one of those would be $300 extra just to process and work with the title company that's closing the transaction, et cetera. Okay. All right. That's good. Yeah, because it could be eight different escrow companies because of where the properties are or whoever's got the listing and is selling. And, you know, they always go back and forth about their escrow and their title companies. Exactly. And, and I would think the, uh, that so, would be eight separate purchase and sale agreements, eight separate escrows, et cetera. Right. Now, if what you about the title? Is, do you, is it important that they use the same title? as what the title is that, that's being on the property that's being purchased? In terms of the title insurance company? Yes. Uh, it doesn't really have to. It, it does make things a little easier sometimes if the same company's handling all the sales and all the purchases, et cetera. But uh, you don't have to. It's, it's kind of uncommon to do that because uh, usually in each transaction, a different party chooses you know, yeah. the escrow and title company to work with. Um, so it's not required. It's it, we're we're used to working with a bunch of different ones on each transaction. Okay. Great. This is really great. Does and I it... thought of uh, one quick thing. Eugene asked about uh, land trusts. Uh, so mm -hmm. I thought I'd cover that real quick too, because land trusts are two things. They are pass through entities, which means anything that happens inside that entity gets passed through to your tax return. So the land trust doesn't file its own tax return. It's also a disregarded entity, which means it's ignored for tax purposes. That gives you a lot of flexibility with land trusts. So for example, you might own a property, uh, an apart, let's say a multifamily property in a land trust. You sell it and you sell it out of the land trust. You're doing a 1031 exchange. You go to buy the new property and you wanna buy the new property in the same land trust or a different land trust. And the lender says, nope, we won't finance you if you're holding title in a land trust. You have to take title in your individual name. Then once it closes, you can put it into the land trust. Uh, that would work because it's a disregarded entity. So it's all boils down to Eugene is the actual taxpayer. Now, unfortunately, that would defeat the purpose of a land trust because now you're on recorded title. But that's just an example yeah. that it's a disregarded entity. So it, it, you've got some options there. Okay. I, I've, Does got, anyone... I've, I've got yeah. one other. That's not really, maybe it's a question. Because you were talking about uh, fix and flips don't necessarily count. Uh, it's the intent. So I used to do a lot of fix and flips and we would hold it. I think uh, my accountant used to handle it. We did our fix and flips in an S Corp. Everything we were going to do for buy and hold, we did in a different type of entity. On occasion, though, I would buy something at an entity, which means the intent was to hold, but I didn't. Is that kind of cheating? If I was going to use a 1031? I, I never did a 1031 using that, but as you, as you were talking about, it's about the intent, because occasionally we would buy things in that, in that entity that were, were intended to be hold and we, we didn't hold them. Got it. Uh, it's my favorite answer. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, the, the strategy you're using is fabulous uh, because you put all your, you know, buy and hold in one and your fix and flip in another. It's very easy to show that. And if you get audited, you can say these are always a hold and these are always a flip. And that's the way it is. And we always suggest, you know, don't cross pollinate. Try not to, you know, flip ones you're holding. But sometimes it happens. So if it's just a one-off, maybe one every year or every other year or something like that, you could probably look at it and say, look, you did have the intent to hold it. That's why you bought it in the holding entity. But there was a reason to, to get rid of it. Sometimes we've had clients who did an exchange, bought a property. Within a week or two, they got an offer that is huge from somebody. And in most cases, you're not going to turn that down. So technically it's a flip, but that wasn't your intent. 
Uh, so you, but the, the issue is if you get audited, they're not going to believe you. <laughs> so you have to be able to demonstrate my intent was to hold. However, uh, so if you can get, you know, an email from the client that's or the buyer that says, you know, I know you're holding this or I know whatever, but uh, and you just bought it. But I really want to buy this property. I'll give you X for it. And you go back and forth by email negotiating. That's great proof that you really intended to hold it. But out of the blue, you got an offer you couldn't say no to. So it all goes to what can you prove should you get audited? All right. Thank you. You bet. Well, it's, you would still have a capital or you just have to do another 1031 if somebody came in and offered a made an offer to you. Well, now you have a capital gain again and you just bought it. You're going to have to do another 1031. So what difference that would that make to the IRS? Because you just did another 1031 your intent was to hold and you didn't and you didn't take the profits and pocket them you did another 1031 I, that's a good point especially uh, you know if it looks like it might be a flip and then you do another exchange and you buy another replacement property and hopefully that replacement property you hold for a number of years right it's a lot easier to argue i did have the intent i got an offer i couldn't say no to i did another exchange and i did hold the next property for a long time and it helps demonstrate that was your intent um, if you did a quick flip and then did an exchange bought another property did another quick flip that gets into the i don't believe you category and that's exactly. where you have a, a difficult time during an audit exactly exactly yeah, does anyone else have any questions? Maya, might you have a question? Or David, I know you're yeah. very interested in 1031s. Yeah, hey, Peggy, thanks. Um, I have a question for William. Um, based on the last scenario the guy mentioned, he was going to hold on to the property, but he sold it. Does that mean your time starts over again since you sold it and now you're going to 1031 again? Or what happens to your time frame on that? No time frame scenario necessary. In terms of identifying properties or in terms of your holding period or David? Yeah, I, I was fighting my, my mute button. Sorry about that. Um so obviously it was an exchange. So you yeah. bought the property, gone through your period or whatever it was, whatever time frame it is, but but you bought the property, now you you're reselling it. So what happens at that point with, with the timeframes? At that point, you've got a brand new sale, brand new 1031 exchange. So you have a brand new 45 days to identify and another 180 days to complete the exchange. So brand new timeframes. Um, the other thing to look at is, you know, the first property was a short-term hold. Uh, then you sold it in exchange. The holding period in terms of defining capital gain, which is typically 12 months, the holding period tax on. So whatever the holding period for the first property was, and then you do an exchange into a new property and you hold that property for a period of time, the old holding period tax on to the new property. So we've had clients who bought property, hold it six, seven, eight months, got a great offer, sold it, did another exchange, bought another property, held that one for six, seven, eight months. So now you've passed the 12 month holding period for capital gain rates, and then they could sell at that point and they would qualify for long-term capital gains. So there's some interesting planning opportunities there to get you out of ordinary income and into capital gains, as long as you truly have the intent to hold for investment. It sounded like it was like 30 days to 60 days. So I'm just curious kind of the, the time frame for that. Uh, 30 days to 60 days for, for what time period? Uh, to resell. I mean, he was gonna hold on to it. He got a great offer. It, 30 to 60 days it closed oh gotcha yeah i mean you're going to have you know typically 30 to 60 days to close uh i mean that'll be a totally separate transaction so you're going to you know once you sell that property for you know from that unexpected buyer you're going to have your usual closing period so that won't change once the closing occurs you'll have the same typical 1031 exchange period as well so use that 60 days to go find another property Absolutely. Yep. You Always wait. The key is getting your timeline down pat. You know what your timeline is going to be, getting your deadlines kind of down pat, getting your team in, in place, whoever you're going to work with, you know, your title, your escrow, your qualified intermediary, your financial advisor, legal, tax, et cetera. Stuff happens when you're in the middle of a transaction. 
and you're not going to have time to go out and find your team. So always, uh, you know, have your team ready to go just in case stuff happens. Yeah, I love the reverse market. I mean, reverse, uh, reverse 1031. We just can't get anybody to really understand it and how nice it is for them. <laughs> Yeah, it does. When I do exchanges, the only one I do is a reverse because it takes all the risk out of it. You can do yeah, all, all of it. All of it. It's a, a beautiful way to go. I, they are. It's a lot more complicated. Lenders don't like them. Um, there are lenders who are beginning to look at them. Uh, there's a few that have actually created a, a product specifically for reverse 1031 exchanges. Uh, your interest rate is going to be higher than a typical mortgage broker, of course, but but they get it. So if you've got a large enough capital gain sitting there, I, I think it's absolutely worth it. Why, why would they, why would the interest be higher? Typically with those programs, it's outside the box. Most of the lenders don't want to touch them. There is a perceived increased risk because we're holding title to the property, not the actual borrower. They're worried that if something happens and they have to foreclose or what have you, that there's going to be some extra risk there. There really isn't. There's, it's secured by the property. Um, so it's so the rates are higher. They're not as bad as like a hard money, private money type deal. Right. Uh, but they're not your typical mortgage rates either. Well, maybe they need more education. Could be, yeah. That, that's what I find education so important. They should see how secure it actually is because when you're holding it, everything's going to be paid for. That's part of the contract is that the mortgage has to be paid on time, the property taxes have to be paid, the insurance policy has to be paid, and a liability has to be put in place. I mean, it's so much better for the lender. <laughs> as, as a third party, making sure it all happens. They call Very us true. property managers in a fam if it's a multifamily. <laughs> Yep. And maybe a little more competition wouldn't hurt. So if there's any lenders on the on the pr presentation, uh, take a look at it. Okay, I'll, I'll look into that. So do you have a specific lender that's actually doing this or no, or a company? There, let's see, the one that I can re remember offhand is a company called LendSure. And they specifically have a program. They rolled it out about a year ago that does reverse 1031 exchanges. Um and so they, I think you, they would go to you, and then you would go through LendSure to do that. Okay. Well, I call them and talk to them. Yeah. Yep. So like that. So we're at the top of the hour. Does anyone have a last minute question for Bill on ten thirty one? Maya, might you have anything? Just out of curiosity. I don't have a question at this moment in time, but I'm definitely calling both of you after this call. Okay, great. That's Thanks. really good. Or you could stay on and I'll talk to you after if you'd like. Sounds Happy good. To do that also. Well, Bill, thank you very much for coming. It was great. What a fantastic presentation. Yes, and look at everybody loved it. That's really terrific. So we hope you will come back on again at some point. And Happy Elena couldn't be here to do her presentation too. So, thank you, Peggy. Oh, you are here. You just say William. I see. Thank you, Elena, for being here. Of course. Thank you. I'm glad you had a good meeting today. So, everyone, yes. we'll see you next week, same time, same station, right here. And have a really fantastic week. And if you do not have a chance to come back, particularly Bill and Alina, I hope you have a very wonderful Thanksgiving and a great dinner too. Thank you, you Thank too. You. Take Thank care. You. See you later. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bill. Great presentation. Thank you, Peggy. You're welcome. Bye.